Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in Australia or overseas. Thank you all for joining us for this second webinar in our Tech Talk series run by the Digital Transformation and Delivery Division at the Department of Health. My name is Janine Bennett and I am the program's engagement lead. Today I join you from Canberra, Australia, the lands of the Ngunnawal people who for over 200 well, sorry, 20,000 years have been shaping the places we now know as Southern New South Wales and the ACT. I would like to open our discussion by acknowledging these and the many other traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today right across Australia and the world and to pay my respects to those cultural leaders past, present and emerging. It is a pleasure to welcome you all from your offices and homes across Australia and overseas. I would especially like to welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us today. It's an honour to have you with us and we wish you and all those attending a very happy Reconciliation Week. Before we get started, we wanted to do some quick housekeeping. So please note that this webinar is being recorded. The recording will be made available with captioning on the health website approximately two weeks after the event. Um, I might also just mention up front that it took us a little longer than two weeks after our first tech talk, um, but we've worked through the teething pains of our new uh, web space on the health website, um, and we'll be able to get that new recording up as soon as the captioning is done. If you experience any technical difficulties during the event today, we do recommend that you use the phone line to dial in. There's details of that in your invite. Um, it includes a phone number and also an access code that will allow you to get back into the session. As with the last Tech Talk, we've secured a, a big block of time at the end of this event for questions and answers. Um, we will have some really good representation from health and from the Australian um, the Australian Digital Health Agency available to answer your questions. Um, if questions arise during the presentations, definitely feel free to, rise them, uh, to raise them using the Slido function. Um, so Slido gives you an opportunity to pose a question, also to vote up a question if someone else has asked something that you'd like to see answered on, on um, the Q&A uh, part of the panel. Um, if uh, you haven't used Slido before, there's a button um, on the right hand of your WebEx screen. You can select Slido window there or panel and type your question. Don't forget to submit um, uh, the question so that it can be formally uh, workflowed through and become a public question that other people can vote on. Questions can be raised anonymously, but um, we really encourage you to include your details. Uh, like we did for the last Tech Talk, we'll be inviting folks with questions to the stage so that they can ask the panel directly. Um, so the more um, people that we can invite into those conversations, um, the, the better it will be for everyone. Um, we're a large group. We'll get through as many questions as we can. We have a great agenda today. We're featuring Faith Lavaris, the Assistant Secretary leading Health's Digital Transformation Agenda. We also have Paul Creech joining us, um, who is the Chief Program Officer at the Australian Digital Health Agency, as well as Dale Norton, our Assistant Secretary for the Aged Care Services and Sustainability Branch. But first, um, in the spirit of grounding all of our technology discussions to our real world purpose, I'd like to introduce Eliza Strapp. Eliza is the first Assistant Secretary for the Market and Workforce Division here at Aging and Aged Care at the Department of Health. Eliza joined Health in 2020 to lead the Aged Care COVID-19 Task Force and has fortunately stayed on to help us drive the Aged Care Reform Agenda, specifically focusing on the work to enable a strong and innovative aged care market and also to ensure that the sector is supported by a qualified and skilled workforce. So I'd like to welcome Eliza and I'll hand over to her now. Thanks, Janine, and um, hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here and it's um, great to have an opportunity to really um, uh, connect policy outcomes with um, how we use technology in the aged care um, sector. Um, I'm going to focus on one part of my job um, for this um, kind of opening um, presentation, which is around um, increasing financial transparency um, and the kind of aims of that and how we can use, um, how that links to um, how we can better use technology um, to make everyone's life easier. 
Uh, so a key key message we heard through the Royal Commission um, uh, and in in our um, subsequent many um, engagements with older Australians is that uh, consumers are expecting um, uh, information should be available to them uh, to make them to ensure that they can make informed decisions about their care. And part of this is um, information about how aged care providers spend their money. Um, uh, the desire for ex extra information by consumers um, and by government, though, um, doesn't need to mean uh, a huge increase um, in administrative burden to providers. And I think digital, digital transformation uh, enables consumers um, to have access to more timely information, but it can also um, minimise the burden on providers. So um, many of you on the online today would know that over the last six months, we've been working with aged care providers to design new reporting requirements. So these reporting requirements will um, assist the government to monitor and support providers, uh, particularly those that um, uh, might be experiencing um, business failures or uh, viability issues. Uh, and it also aims to protect consumers from potential disruptions to um, care services they receive and allows us to target appropriate support to providers that um, uh, uh, might be at risk of failure. Um, the other reason is to increase financial transparency in, into the sector is also to allow consumers to make more informed choice about their care um, and to feed that into things like star ratings um, and, and other and other information, how to how they make their choice about where where they choose to be cared for. So to achieve this, the government um, needs access to more timely uh, and regular information about the financial performance of the sector. So to date, um, we've relied on a, an annual financial report, um, which is due four months after the end of a financial year. Um, it's a, it's a, a considerable lag time from um, when um, the financial year ends, and it's really um, uh, provided a challenge for the government to identify providers at risk and also to be able to provide timely, almost real-time information to consumers, which is what they, they are after. So um, in response to this, um, from July this year, um, providers will be required to submit a quarterly financial report. Um, the first quarterly financial report's due um, in, on the 4th of November, 2022. And this report will include um, a list of viability and prudential compliance related questions for both residential and home care providers. It will include a approved provider financial statement. It'll include care labour cost and hours reporting for residential care and home care providers. And it will also include a quarterly food and nutrition report. So bringing them all together, I know that's currently separate. Um, so this information will be made public through a range of mechanisms that are uh, designed to increase transparency and inform consumers. Um, the financial information, so this includes financial information, especially how aged care providers spend their money. Uh, it'll be published as part of the annual government statement, and it'll also be published through star ratings over time. Um, food and nutrition information will also be published as part of the annual governance statement and through the star ratings over time. And care minutes will also be published through star ratings from December 2022. So we we do understand that increased reporting can put additional burden on uh, aged care providers, um, and that's why, uh, as part of the digital transformation agenda, agenda, we're working towards building digital digitalized financial reporting capabilities, and why this conversation is so important. We're really seeking to upgrade our data collection systems and automate the collection of information as much as possible using APIs to connect providers to government. Um, and so on the subject of digital transformation, I'm um, I'm going to hand over to um, uh, Faye Flavaris now um, uh, um, on this topic. Thanks, Faye. Thank you, Eliza. So what a great welcoming opening statement around some of our priorities. Um, it just goes to show just how important it is uh, around digital enablement and that, you know, your work to drive the new financial and care reporting uh, requirements provide a timely reminder of why technology is so important for aged care reform. So it's not about the tech, as we keep saying, it is 
clearly about the outcomes that we need to um, drive in the sector, working smarter, cleaner, using modern and streamlined digital enablers to achieve two things. One, providing improved transparency or performance and data. And two, while freeing up for humans to focus on the more high value tasks around um, care rather than doing administrative things. So thank you so much, Eliza. Um, I'm going to take just a, a two second break and I understand maybe uh, we have some uh, Slido or Q&A technical difficulties. So um, I'm just going to um, let you guys know that we're working on it and that we're aware. Uh, my understanding is if you go to your apps at the bottom and you select it, it should be able to um, um, turn on. Um, but I'm just waiting to see if the team can get that up and running. So uh, more on that as soon as we get some more information. Uh, we've got some people on the in the back trying to get it restarted for us. Okay, but uh, just moving on, um, a little bit of a recap from last time when we did Tech Talk. Um, and just to link uh, the messages that we've just heard from Eliza around uh, where we're up to um, around uh, why it's so important for us to get digitally ready. Um, time for consumers to make decisions about, uh, we need to get the information so that consumers can have the data in real time so that they can actually make decisions around their care. But it's also really important for the sector to have all the tools and data available to them so they can um, you know, provide that care in the best quality outcomes. So to recap, we're just using this digital maturity roadmap to help kind of articulate where we're up to on things. And some of the priorities that Eliza just talked around, around care minutes um, and also the food and nutrition and some of that financial transparency. In the first instance, I think we're getting, we're working on getting to a digitized step, which is that third step in the maturity roadmap. But a big part of why we're here today together is so that we can start figuring out how to get connected and automated, which is that fourth step. So how do we get the sector giving this information to us uh, in an automated fashion rather than you guys getting online and, and using the portal and maybe doing it twice? So I just wanted to use that as a really good example of, you know, what is digital and, and what goals are we trying to aim for and when? Um, so when I say the sector, I mean digital improvement for providers and government um, systems working together. So um, thank you for that. Um, moving on, a little bit more of a recap from our first tech talk. Um, we had over 415 registrations, although I think uh, this one's clocked it a little bit, so let's see how we go. And we had about 261 unique logins. Um, a big part of, you know, getting digitally connected is to figure out, um, you know, how we've engaged with the conversation with you guys in the sector. And a part of uh, a good conversation is playing back what we heard. And so we got 88 questions. Um, we haven't got all the answers for you here today in that we wanted to give the opportunity for us to brief our incoming government first. Um, and get some of their feedback on that. Um, but we have got some more information about those 88 and I'll, I'll give you a little bit more on the themes that came out just up next. Uh, we did get 50% um, attendees were from the service provider landscape in the sector. Um, and we got a pretty good satisfaction rating for our first go. Um, so just wanted to share that with you. You'll also know that we put a call out to everyone um, to for some volunteers to include um, some co-design sessions. So we're coming to you probably every four to six weeks around the tech talks. But as a, a parallel track, we're working with our volunteers around the co-designing of uh, how do we get to that automated uh, connected ecosystem. So that's just a little bit of a snapshot on the kind of the statistics of the first tech talk. And then out of the 88 questions that we received from you, uh, these were the, the big six themes. Um, now, these will go up onto our engagement hub, um, but we analysed the in-session questions and all the ones that you left on the Slido. 
And we collated these um, comments, suggestions, ideas from the survey, from the post-event survey as well. And uh, we were able to develop some really clear themes. And to summarise, this is what we heard around it. Um, we needed to workforce and consumers around digital literacy, both for the sector's workforce, but also for consumers. So that was one of them. Um, we wanted to clarify some of the incentives available to help uh, with digital solutions, so that's part of that theme. We saw lots of questions around um, data considerations, and so um, given that we've highlighted that data will be one of our focus areas in the third Tech Talk that's coming, so we're working on um, getting you a deep dive on that. We saw lots of questions around privacy, consent and security data, so that's really important as we get connected on who has access to which data and when. Um, also, attendees ask for visibility of the value and um, that we're intending to deliver uh, for providers and consumers. So that whole value chain visibility, I think, was really important. Um, and as you can see, we've put our minds to documenting and understanding these themes and then using them to help drive what our next priorities are um, and how we can then use this information um, to brief, you know, our business, but also our new ministers um, when they join or minister. So um, also very popular questions around being client-centred and how we get involved in the co-design. Um, so the volunteers that pro who um, we already met with last Friday, and I'll give you a little bit of a recap on what we talked about there, um, we've already started that co-design process. Um, and as you can see, um, once our new minister is conf um, confirmed and briefed, then we'll provide all the questions and the details up on the engagement site. So for today, I'm going to focus on the last theme being the co-design because of our volunteers. So we did pull the call to action out there and thank you to those who did volunteer. Uh, we say 25 plus volunteers, but I actually think we're about at 30 plus at the moment. Um, so it was a, a lovely first um, introduction with them that we had last week. Um, we had a we had individual representation from all these different subsections of the sector. So service providers, peak bodies, ICT peak bodies. We had some software vendors. We had health uh, representatives. We even had end, end user consumers. Um, so you can see a very nice, lovely spectrum of people to help inform um, the co-design. We're looking for a strong response across the broad representation. We're probably missing one or two stakeholders that I think we would like to have more representation in, and we'll actively look to get some more people involved there. Um, next slide, please. Um, on the agenda last week, when we met for our first co-design, um, we held that on the 27th of May. Um, we, we did a bit of a welcome intro and a scene setting. Um, we again set some business context for them because nothing we do in tech alone, we always do to achieve a business outcome. We did a bit of a group exercise and scene setting around how to set ourselves up for success. Um, and it was really important that we heard from the volunteers on how do they want to co-design with us and some of our immediate priorities. If I'll, those immediate priorities, uh, Dale will speak to a little bit later on in today's session. So just to keep everyone across it. So as we do the parallel track with our co-designers, um, volunteers, we will keep giving you a regular update. It's almost like your status update here to, to make sure that we keep everyone uh, engaged. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a big part of the considerations with our volunteers, and I just want to share this, is that anything we publish in the co-design session um, will be made available to everyone. So you're not missing out if you weren't a volunteer in that sense, that information will be provided to everyone, um, but you may not be in that you know, specific design session. Um, all of the names of the um, co-design volunteers will be published. We ask the attendees, uh, we'll be recording them, um, 
their attendees. We won't be recording the session though. I think they're too technical, the workshops, to kind of record and put up on the engagement hub. But any documentation and a summary of all the outcomes will be published up to the engagement hub. We did talk about IP and that any, any um, input provided in those co-design sessions uh, will not have IP applying to them. So, you know, it, it's free for them to, um, whatever ideas they put forward in the co-design is open to everyone. And uh, it's all going to be public knowledge. So uh, we will be, you know, we're not explicitly asking them to sign NDAs or anything like that because it's an open co-design session. Uh, we did um, talk about fair and equitable access to all this information and that's why we wanted to go in with these important considerations to make sure it was an open, transparent co-design cohort um, and that it was available to everyone. Um, we did focus on digital enablement activities first, if I can ask for the next slide. Um, so where to, like how are we going to focus on co-designing together? So um, essentially, the, the, we did the April tech talk, number one, great. We asked for volunteers and we, we got them. Thank you so much. Uh, those in late May, we closed the nominations. We did our first welcome meeting and we started to talk about um, how we were going to co-design together and what were some of the methodologies we were going to use around um, making sure that we were human centered, uh, that we were going to leverage some design thinking approaches, that we would try and look at problem spaces and test and learn with lean innovation and then use that to help drive an agile delivery on things. So kind of wanted to just give you guys a little bit of a snapshot of that parallel track and the first bit of the co-design that we have done with everyone in the sector. Um, I want to acknowledge the volunteers as it's not an insignificant amount of time um, that they're going to invest in time and thinking and, and we at Health really want to thank you, thank them uh, for joining us on this. So I think that's a bit of a recap for you of where we've been and uh, what we did in the first tech talk, what we've done in the first co-design session. Um, Without further ado, and I'm just going to check in and make sure we're all back on track. Um, have we got our Slido polling and Q&A up and running, Janine? Uh, you're on mute. That's like the meme of the century at the moment. How's that? <laughs> Thank you. Um, Slido is working for some folks, but not everybody. We have put a link into the chat. So there's a link and a password there. If you're not seeing Slido in your WebEx window, then you can click on that link and it will open it up in another browser window um, and you're good to submit questions there. Um, if you've tried to use Slido post all of these mitigations and it's still not working for you, feel free to put your hand up when we get to Q&A and we'll keep an eye out for people um, who just want to come to the stage and um, ask us a, a question straight up. Yeah, thanks very I'll, much. Or put it in the chat, I guess. <laughs> There's always that too. Thank so you. So without further ado, and have we got uh, Paul with us? Uh, I'd like to introduce, introduce Paul Creech, who's joined us here today. Um, it's about our working in partnership together with ADHA and ensuring that we are thinking about, you know, how to government together um, is going to introduce changes with you guys in the sector. Uh, do we have Paul with us? Let's see. Got to love it. I'm thinking not. Laura, is Laura with us? We're having good fun today without technology. I am here. Paul is online. Uh, I'm just trying to okay. I could let him in. Tanya, if we could maybe just move Laura to stage. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Ah, Paul Creech here. I can see him. Oh. He needs to be let in. Can someone lead, let him in? <laughs> That's always a good start. <laughs> go. Hi, Paul. Love digital. When he's there, I'll drop off. No, it's all right. It's all good. Tanya, we let Paul in. 
At least you know we're keeping it real, folks. There he is. I've now seen him let in. Can we put him up on centre stage? How are you, Laura? I'm very well, thank you, Faye. Nice to see you again online and very nice to have met you in person for the first time last week as well. I know. For Laura and I met for the first time in IRL, in real life. Um, so it was nice. Uh, we had a chat with some of our uh, sector CIOs. Now we've got Paul there, but I can't see his video. But there he is. Hello, how are you? you? I'm very well, thank you. Laura, you can stay on, please. It's good good to know all that's involved, uh, everyone that's involved. Um, Faye, you can hear me, I take it? We can. Thumbs up from yeah. me. And listen, thank you for the invite uh, and hello to all. Um, we live in an interesting world. I, I know there's an awful lot of people on this call, but I cannot see any of you, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who I'm talking to in reality, um, but for those of you who don't know me, my name is Paul Creech. I'm the Chief Program Officer with the Digital Health Agency, um, working on a program of work across the aged care sector in response to the Royal Commission, as an awful lot of people are. Uh, and Faye has, has asked me along today to talk a little bit in relation to not just the work that we're doing, but I guess a bit of a focus on how we want to work really closely with our broader health portfolio colleagues to, to, to sequence this work uh, as it's important that we uh, we work together to understand the pain points, the pressures that this is going to bring on everybody involved. Uh, and if we can better understand them, try to mitigate some of those risks. Um, I, I suppose at the highest level, our focus at the moment probably goes to recommendation 68, which is the concept of access to clinical information in residents uh, of aged care facilities. We want to enhance aged care participation and MHR and drug adoption uh, to try and help with that seamless transition of information, especially transitioning care settings. And with respect to MHR registration, we're currently trying to understand uh, the gaps and barriers in the adoption, uh, how we can increase adoption and use, and how we can appropriately guide the MHR uh, registration in, in, in aged care facilities. Uh, to that end, uh, I suppose one of the things that we're really keen on, and we're doing this in a number of forums, we've got our own aged care advisory group, we're participating on a number of other aged care advisory groups and, and we're seeking feedback from um, the National Council and others. Uh, we're keen to understand where the pain points are so we can look to work to mitigate, especially in the context of an oncoming government. They touched on this a little while ago. Um, we will work through what that means for us as bureaucrats uh, managing these programs. Uh, we're keen to understand from your perspective where you think our focus should be and we can filter that into the mix. If I, oh, no, I won't say if I can move to the next slide because it looks like we've already moved to the next slide. Thank you very much. Um, I, I wanted to share this information. Um, some of it's already, it's already been out there, so some of you may have already seen this. Uh, but from our perspective, these are the partners that we're working with in the first instance to drive this work. Um, a number of them you'll recognise. For those of you on the call from aged care provider land, uh, you either work with them daily, you know them well or you don't. But if you're thinking about where you want to go, this might give you some... I suppose, um, information or advice that can play into any decisions that you have to make. Um, purpose of the agency partnering with industry in this way is to drive that adoption and interaction that we talked about before. Uh, building on what Faye said, uh, we really want this to be a co-design piece. So not just the aged care advisory group that we've got in play, uh, how we design, whether it be an aged care transfer summary or how the customer journey works in practice, but how we work with the, the software industry as well um, to build this in. So this is uh, very much a moving feast. Um, the vendors on the slide are currently working with the agency to become conformant activate MHR, facilitate viewing, uh, and have the capability to upload advanced care plans and an ACTS and other things. Um, more than happy to take questions either in the Slido or separately. Um, we will continue to have this conversation, but really what I wanted to do in the first instance is, is uh, I suppose, flesh this out, give you as much information as I can as to where we are, and I suppose talk to you a little bit about our focus. Uh, the one last thing, Faye, that I will touch on, if that's okay, in addition to the co-design piece that we're trying to do with not just the software industry, but our aged care advisory group and others, is work with health on the sequencing, which I've touched on, but also the policy piece. So Eliza touched on the policy work before. Um, I don't need to talk to this group about the significant amount of change that's happening across the sector in response to the Royal Commission and other things that are in play um, from the legislation down. We're keen and we're trying very, very hard to be as connected as we can with our department colleagues in relation to that policy and legislation piece. Again, it goes to the sequencing. 
uh, we can design the best, um, you know, documents in the world when it comes to transfer summaries and all the rest of it. But how do we help you as providers make sure that we've got the right levers in place um, to put the information in to the tech that's designed to support you? How do we make sure that those things become seamless so it takes pressure off workforce, so it takes pressure off you? Um, it, it's big, it's complicated. Uh, what we want is an open conversation. Um, Faye, that's kind of all I had on my list in the first instance. If you're happy, I might stop there. I'll ask if Laura had anything she wanted to add specifically, uh, and I'll throw back to you, Faye, as to where we want to go next. Laura? Nothing else to add. So thanks, Paul. Um, you know, this is just an ongoing conversation, I guess, that the agency is also having through this forum with you all. And um, thanks, Faye, for continually having us with you shoulder to shoulder on the journey. Thank you. Yes, no. Uh, yeah, it's... Uh... It's an onion layer of teaming. It's the social connection and the networking that we have to do in government, but also to the sector. Um, there's a lot of moving parts, and you know, there's a lot of people um, who've got we've got to get a lot out the door priority-wise. And we, um, I know, together in the portfolio, uh, are trying to come together so that we can do it in a coordinated fashion with the sector. So I thought, you know, the slide is just warming up. I think everyone's starting to put their right. questions in, yes? There's a question in there from Jeanette Robinson in relation to, to all the panellists in relation to as a CHSP provider. Um, I can't see all the questions, but I can see this one. I, I thought it might have been touching on this. Um, as I said before, and I won't speak for, for Faye or anybody else in the Department of Health, there are a myriad of programs, as you know, in the aged care space and respect some of the challenges that all the providers across all the setting all care types um, are facing. Uh, our focus at the moment is on the response to the Royal Commission, as you'll be aware, uh, we have that direction authority from government. Uh, I am keen, as is uh, Laura and everybody in the agency, that as we work to understand um, the best requirement, I guess, for residential aged care and work with the residential aged care sector, uh, we also understand what we might be able to lend to the home care and CHSP space post that, absolutely. Um, as I said, our, our focus is residential aged care at the moment, but that isn't where we want to stop. Uh, that said, um, we need, there's a, a number of processes that we go through, I suppose, to um, seek authority for what the next parts of those programs are. And with the new government, those processes will, in some ways, um, are still yet to be, those discussions are still yet to be had. So, so I guess my, the answer I can give you at the moment in relation to CHSP, um, just from the agency perspective and the clinical conversation, is I am really keen to, to make sure we work with home care and other care setting providers to increase the level of maturity, absolutely. Uh, our focus at the moment is on residential aged care, but we're keen to make sure we don't put things in place now that impede our ability to roll them out or at least understand what those differences are so we can um, make those arrangements as we go. I hope that helps. No, it, um, so I'm going to actually go one step further a little bit, Paul, because we try and mix it up. With this comes risk that, you know, our digital. Uh, so if we can get Jeanette, Jeanette Robinson, so Tanya, if we can get Jeanette Robinson on centre stage with us. And I'm going to repeat the question um, that Paul just um, answered. Is it safe to assume that as a CHSP provider, once the Support at Home program commences, that all of the key stages of the digital maturity framework will apply? So, um, and yep, Paul's just talked to the fact that um, we're starting with residential, like within ADHA. And then I think we've got Jeanette there. This is where, you know, I freak all the audience out, right? Because we get them up on stage. Um, so Jeanette's there. Hey, Jeanette, thank you. If we can get yourself off mute. And this is all goodness. Um, did we answer your question or did you want some more clarification? No, I think that was great. Um, and the reason why I asked it, working in sector support, the one thing that I am getting from all of the standalone CHSP providers that I'm sort of working with is very much around what of this is is going to apply to them in the new world um and and i guess you know that people are feeling a little bit left out of the mix because when you talk about an approved provider that obviously doesn't currently relate to chsp providers who are standalone um and yeah I, I guess it's just the conduit of what's coming so how did they currently plan for 2023 and I think that's that's certainly sort of what I'm hearing from people it's like well what do we do now all of yeah. this other stuff is happening but what do we do to prepare so yeah. thank you for your yeah. response yeah. yeah I might just add I, I um it, it doesn't go to Commonwealth Home Support 
Um, I haven't had a conversation yet with Commonwealth Home Support Providers, but if there are any on the call that are interested in the conversation, I'd be more than happy to. I have had several conversations with Home Care, and I know the synergies between the two programs, and, and some of the reasons that I have given me to have those conversations is I do want to get a, a bit of a, an understanding as to where the commonality, areas of commonality are, some of the synergies, especially as we start designing clinical documents that might be used in aged care, what would be reusable and what wouldn't. Um, again, this is not a, a commitment or authority to, to progress down those programs, but what we do want to do is try and um, call them out as early as possible. So as you articulate, um, these programs that might be next cab off the rank or, or, or second or third uh, can start to understand a little bit with a little bit of clarity what might be coming down the path. Um, so I, I kind of, it, it's hard, it, it's complex, and, and I can't sit here and tell you exactly the way that it's going to play out. But we are really trying to be as open as we can, and I really do encourage anybody from CHSP land that's interested um, to maybe put a note in the chat with the details and, and Laura and I or one of our team can get in contact with you and have a conversation around some of those pain points that you'd like us to look out for and some of those areas of similarity. Um, the other thing there, um, just for yourself, Jeanette and others, um, there will be a post survey here where there's a bit of a free form. So absolutely, you know, any priority areas that you guys have questions around, please add them in there and we synthesise all the information. It goes back to Paul and Laura as well. Um, there's also, you know, and I'm going to qualify this, you know, Paul talks about we haven't got authority to, you know, because new government, we've still got to brief them, they've still got a lot to do, right, um, that we need to do to kind of get the priorities set uh, over the next few months. But that doesn't stop us having discussions now and bringing a lot of the context to the table. Uh, we may not have all the answers, but at least if we get your problem spaces uh, or questions, it, then we can feed that in to the ideation of what some of those priorities could look like. So I, I think this is why it's really important we continue to have these conversations and it potentially feels not quite like the rubber's hitting the road yet, but it will in that because the more we can all get on the same page and the more we can actually understand each other, when it comes time to make decisions, it, they're informed quick decisions that we can do together. So um, really appreciate um, you're coming on centre stage. I should warn people, shouldn't I? <laughs> but, you know, if you've watched the first tech talk, you would have noticed us bringing people up. But uh, it's all goodness. This is all part of the casual connectedness and just getting together. So thank you. Um, there's a uh, next question. Uh, while we have you, Paul, and there is Q&A, but I'm just conscious there was one more question. And then we will throw to um, Dale to give us a little bit of the next item on the agenda, just making sure I've got the... Okay, there is a question. What is MHR? Um, uh, Paul, I think that one's for you. And I know we, we're actually kind of taking a step back. There's a lot of assumed acronyms along the way. And I should apologise. I, I try very, very hard not to use acronyms for that exact reason. I do apologise. Good. Uh, my health record. Um, my health record. So when I talk about adoption and use, I'm talking about my health record. Um, one, one of the things that you might, I guess, appreciate knowing uh, in relation to the my health record uh, or the sharing of, of clinical or health information more broadly, um, it, it'll probably come as no surprise, much like a lot of um, activity across governments and, and the health sector. Um, the pandemic, COVID, has really driven uh, usage uh, in the My Health record. We, we, we are starting from a different base at the moment. Uh, if you look at um, consumer demand or even clinician use in the My Health record over the last 12 to 18 months, um, across some of the, the points has grown in the hundreds of percentage points. So we're really keen, um, I suppose, on the back of that to continue to drive that usage. We're seeing consumers now look for their own information. They're getting pathology reports quicker through MHR than they do direct from laboratories in some instances. So we're really keen to continue to drive that. And we see aged care as another really good opportunity for us to continue to roll that out. So MHR is my health record. Uh, it's not the only um, program in the digital health space. It's, it's one of many uh, things like e-prescribing, uh, the work we're doing in aged care. Um, you know, these things can be separate um, from my health record, but for those people who choose a my health record, very, very keen to continue to drive that demand uh, and, and address um, that demand. There were a couple of other things in there, Faye. I don't think they're questions necessarily, but more two people have reached out. Uh, and if you can provide us those details or the secretary, absolutely. Can, uh, we will absolutely take it on to, to talk to them. Thank you very much for the interest. I really appreciate it. 
Thanks, Paul. Now, we're just going to um, move on to our next agenda, but you're hanging around for Q&A, right? I, I am, absolutely. Excellent. Because <laughs> there's a lot more in there for you. I'm just looking at the Slido. I think we've warmed up on the Slido. Thanks, folks. Um, so we'll get back to some of those. Um, just to give you a little bit more um, context of where we're all going um, to the community, we're going to be moving to Dale now around our digital transformation and a little bit of a playback on the co-design that we've done so far. So Dale, uh, over to you. Thanks, Faye, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I just wanted to, before, as we start, um, I just wanted to just quick, really reiterate the importance of we're talking about this human-centered design and really co-designing with, with you guys. Um, if I could just go to the next slide, I think um, what we did, we, we shared this slide previously, which sort of shows, you know, there was, there's, there's clients, government um, and, and providers, and we're trying to deep dive, I suppose, a little bit on providers, but it is important for us to, I suppose, from our perspective, just be really clear that, you know, everything we're doing is trying to, in, to improve the experience of the client uh, and putting the client at the centre of all of our thinking. Um, so if I think about it, um, you know, within the value chain, there's a number of actual players at play within that value chain and providers being one of those key parts to enable that success um, as we move forward. Um, what we're really trying to do, and, and Eliza set the tone at the start, is really look at ways of how can we now start to reduce some of those administrative burdens that, that potentially um, are impacting everyone across the sector. We're trying to streamline those interactions, particularly with the providers and the government. So anywhere where we can actually automate um, that that sort of that that transmission is going to make a big difference. Um, trying to reduce the duplicate of reporting um, and just reducing any other sort of burden which does have an impact on the regulation compliance standards. We're finding you know increased accuracy and consistency of the data by providing that automated transmission um, will make a very big um, impact as we as we move forward. I think. Um, as we all know, that the, the aged care environment is extremely complex, and what we're not trying to do here is a whole bunch of new, brand new standards, etc. But what we are trying to do is acknowledge that you will have um, already the, some of those complexities, and what we're going to try and do is, is link things up a little bit to make it a little bit more streamlined and and more um, user friendly, if that makes sense, to be able to connect up with government. Next next step. Next slide. Sorry. Um, just as a bit of background, again, um, what we have we. We believe in transformation, we need to implement an approach that supports that effective data sharing and data has come up a few times in the discussion today. Um, our enabling technologies we are looking at is to try and stand, standardise where possible so it's simple and modern and contemporary. Um, this sort of involves, I suppose, employing different sort of connection methods where possible. As I said, not one size fits all. So we have a set of standards and connections, for, for example, in our clinical space, we'll have different standards in our in payment space. What we are trying to do though is connect those together so that we can, I suppose, from, from a provider perspective, make better use of their um, of your software that you already have that enables some of those back, back office and, and can, um, contingencies and, and efficiencies. In this slide, I suppose what we're trying to show is this is really much a very much phased approach. And what we're trying to trying to do here is support the platform. Um, and I'm going to talk about platform, people, process, and tech. Um, so that with its main focus, which is around establishing governance. So when we do set up connections and whatnot, we can establish a platform, we can establish the governance, um, the interactions between the between the sector and, and the government become more seamless. Um, what's really important is actually agreeing the rollout strategy. So as we work together and extending the functionality as an ongoing focus. The implementation, as I said, is looking at a phase rollout. We're up until 2022. Um, what we're really trying to do is prove the concept where we can connect and, and actually do something that's very automated um, to, to assist. Post-2022 um, will be dependent on which where the, the new government will want to continue. But um, for us, it's all about trying to make sure we've got a really strong platform that we can actually build and, and, and grow from. Um, what we're looking at is more in that alpha, that when we talk about the sort of, we're, we're moving into more that release delivery phase, which is that co-design, um, getting ready to sort of get all the requirements, understand the use cases, which is really important, engagement, with, um, looking at our engagement journeys, um, agree on the sort of the strategy, which comes out a lot, what is that sort of engagement strategy? Um, and looking, as I said, everyone's talked about very much the importance of that co-design, co-development type, 
type approach. If I can just go to the last slide I've got here. Um, it's important also that we've, re, we've started that co-design process. And one of the things that really came out of that co-design process was, was really what is true co-design and actually working together. Now, I think um, what we are sort of, we're, ne we're now moving away from sort of industry partner workshops to more sector partner workshops. Um, and there's been probably, this is the sort of key feedback that came back as part of our first co-design session, which was really around how do you want to work with us, what works, what doesn't, and Faye touched a little bit on that. And as you can see there, um, what we've got there is we've got a couple of key themes, which is around improving the, com the communication, um, increasing the levels of collaboration, looking at the strategy, um, which includes uh, using new sort of tools and approaches to improve um, engagement, and finally, um, what other things um, you know we, we can improve is which will drive our solution development. So the feedback that we can continue to get through those processes is really critical. Um, it goes towards us, as I said, starting to move towards that sort of um, more automated approach with the way we, we work between government and, and the provider sector. So thanks, thanks for your time. Thanks, Dale. I think um, we did a bit of a, uh, you know, quick uh, hustle through a few agenda items, and I just want to take five minutes to quickly recap on them, and then we're going to, as the team's getting ready for Q and A. Um, so, if I think about what did we touch today, just to make sure that um, we're all on the same page, um, we did a bit of a deep dive on aged care. Uh, market and workforce with Eliza. Uh, unfortunately, Eliza needed to go, but we do have uh, Jason Fraser with us to help us in Q&A on anything business related. I gave you a bit of a progress update. So where did we come from? How did we go with Tech Talk One? And what did we hear from you? Uh, what was the parallel uh, stream around co-design? And Dale's just gone through and given you a bit of a, a rundown on some of the themes that came out of that and how people want to collaborate with us. Uh, the working in partnership with Paul and ADHA and the team, Laura. Um, so fantastic and we're really only touching the surface on some of this stuff um, and it's really important that we you know come together uh, and work with you in the sector on it um, there's a myriad of questions that we can go through now together uh, and of course then the transformation focus so how do we get ready to be connected like how do we set up some of that tick technical platform piece? Uh, how do we get our certification process up and running so that we can connect the different uh, vendors and facilities and providers together? And so that real technical piece is happening in the co-design um, and setting up our business to government gateways with our ADHA and um, Department of Health. So kind of some of it where the rubber hits the road a bit. So over to um, the Q&A piece now. So I'm hoping you guys have liked the, the snippets of information that we had to share with you since the last time we spoke about um, things. Um, we've got two kind of um, areas for questions now. Um, I'm going to see if we can get uh, Peter Derrida up on centre stage. Um, that's one of the questions that's on the chat. And then at the same time, if we can look at the Slido um, and, and maybe we, uh, you know, start to get George Margellis ready as well. So uh, that's a little bit of effort for our Tanya, our director, coordinator in the background. Uh, while we're waiting for um, them to get up on centre stage, I'll start with Peter's. Um, Faye, can I just quickly interject? Um, I just sure. wanted to give um, Jason and Laura a chance to introduce themselves. Oh, perfect. Um, since Thank we're you. inviting them to the stage. Um, so we might hand over to Jason first. And if you can just tell us about your role, Jason, that'd be great. Thanks, Janine. Um, Jason Fraser, I'm uh, Assistant Secretary of the ICT Strategy and Business Assurance Branch. Uh, we're working in the Reform Implementation Division and looking forward to answering all your questions today. Thanks, Janine. Thanks, Jason. How about you, Laura? Yeah, What's hi. You before? 
<laughs> yes, yes, I was along uh, for the first digital tech talk as well. So Laura Toyne uh, working in the program delivery branch in the Australian Digital Health Agency um, with responsibility for a range of the of programs, including sort of the delivery on the aged care aspects as well. Great. Well, welcome. So we have um, Laura and Jason joining Faye, Paul and Dale to the stage and we're ready to put you guys in the hot seat. So. Um, my understanding is that we're just queuing up some folks so I might just really quickly um, direct a question to Paul. What is an aged care transfer summary? Thank you. Uh, a great question. If I said ACTS before again I'll <laughs> apologise for using acronyms. So an aged care transfer summary is a, is a document that we're developing at the moment that will be a summary of important clinical information that will travel with an aged care resident as they transition between care types. So if you've got a, if you've got a resident in aged care that has to be taken to emergency um, the, the aged care transfer summary will be the document that supports that transition, much like uh, I would say a discharge summary from hospitals that operates in the in the, the digital health space or the my health record space at the moment. Great, thanks, Paul. Um, and having listened to a couple of the ADHA presentations recently, I know how important that transfer of information is in setting the context of care for incoming um, residents and patients. So. Um, yeah, really, really great initiative there. Um, while we get George Magalis to the stage, I will ask an anonymous question. This one's for you, Faye. Will you be extending this to providers who currently have their own systems and capability to work with APIs? We don't want to purchase a vendor system. So I'm guessing that this might be the provider management system. Um, so yeah, it's I'm assuming, and um, given that they haven't put a name, we're talking about connecting to business to government gateway. At the end of the day, um, we're not going to force people to go and use a third party software provider or vendor. If you uh, have your own IT system in house, um, you can absolutely, you know, get certified and go through the process and connect directly. Um, it, it's about opening up the the channels. And, and leveraging um, and, and creating a solution that's available to everyone. So I know it's sort of the big into town have their own IT shops and great, they can absolutely connect to us. Um, kind of in the middle, if you guys are leveraging software vendors, then yes, you know, you guys can um, look to uh, leverage them as they get connected. I'm hoping that um, answered the question. If not, kind of write a bit more in the Q and A for us. And then um, over to George. George, you had a question for us. Yeah, hi everyone. So George Margellis from the Aged Care Industry Information Technology Council. Um, first of all, look, congratulations. Like having been involved in health for about 30 years, having these tech talks before the fact rather than after the fact is a, is a real breath of fresh air. So we really appreciate that. Uh, I'm down here at the Digital Health Festival in, in, in Melbourne with about 2,000 other people and aged care is a major topic. And Amanda mentioned it today in her keynote. One of the key issues is that uh, the more data we can get into my health record, the more usable it'll be both in aged care and healthcare. So it really is that how do we drive that uh, clinicians to upload more data? Do we facilitate that through simple APIs or other other ways? Or is it a cultural change we need to instigate to get more data into my health record? Because it's a classical network effect, the more data you have in there, the more valuable it is for people to continue to access it and use it. And you get that uh, steamrolling effect where ultimately it becomes you know, a, a single source of truth. Any comments? Go, Paul. <laughs> You're waiting. Over Thanks, to you, George. Paul. George, thank you. Uh, and listen, um, uh, I love how passionate you are about this subject, as am I. And it's one of the reasons that I, I guess I tried to provide a little bit of context about what we've seen in the digital health space over the last 18 months, two years, two and a half years. Um, you're right, you know, the more that's in there, the more useful it becomes. And that's exactly kind of the tenant that we're looking to drive. If you look at the pathology space, as I touched on before, um, we had, I, I think the number was, and, and you can quote me, but I'm going to talk round numbers in January 21. We had um, consumers, individual views by consumers, uh, was it about 1.5 million in January 21 of pathology um, reports? In sorry, it wasn't just that was consumer views in, in in the My Health record in January 22. It was over 13 million, and it was because information's there driving its use. Uh, you know, you go through the COVID pandemic. It wasn't all pathology either, even though pathology was a lot of it. 
but because the information is being there, people understand the value and people use it. Uh, I, I think that uh, it, it's powerful. Uh, and as I said before, um, creating more use cases like this that we can build out actually is where the, the value proposition is. Um, moving from pathology now, I think we've got a couple of opportunities. We're doing a piece of work uh, in um, diagnostic imaging as well, a proof of concept in diagnostic imaging. Um, so we can look at an e-referral process that will put that information in there quicker so people can start to use it. Uh, the agency is looking at uh, an in-house uh, app um, to not only, you know, in parallel with doing the work to try and make sure the information's in the My Health record, if we can put access to that information in the palm of people's hands so they've got it whenever they need it, wherever they are, it becomes a really powerful tool. Uh, and I just see aged care as, as, as another a segment of this conversation where if we can get the information in there, it can really start to support people uh, in their lives better than it does at the moment. So um, I, I agree, George, I think we've got a lot of work to do. It, it's come along though, we've come a long way. Uh, I know it's probably taken longer than people would have would have liked, and by people, I mean inside the agency especially, um, but it is coming along and it's coming along quite well, especially through the pandemic. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, George. Hopefully that answered your question. And I think to add just a little bit there, we are working closely with ADHA and in standing up some of our new platform capabilities uh, in my age care, it's about how do we bring all of that together to go um, from a provider perspective. Earlier today, Eliza was talking about, you know, some of the information they're trying to collect. And again, it's around, you know, some's medical, some's not medical. Um, how do we do it once and share it many? And so um, if we can look to embedding those principles at the beginning of our thought process when we're doing some of this co-design, I think uh, we'll definitely create better outcomes across the board for all of us. Uh, Janine, what's our next question? So I might um, just ask if we can get Michelle Jenkins um, on the stage. Thank you, George, for joining us. And while Michelle's getting set up, I'll ask you a quick anonymous question. Um, would today's presentation touch on the home care side of aged care service? And I'm happy for anyone from the panel to jump in for this one. Um, I'm going to say, no, it's not. Uh, we specifically haven't touched on any of it today, simply because it's one of the priorities that need to be briefed from our incoming government. Um, today was a bit of a recap of where we've come from, like Tech Talk 1 and the first co-design session. Um, from a business context, we went to uh, with Eliza from the market and workforce um, area. So that was the, the deep dive today. Uh, I'm thinking of today's uh, feedback, uh, support at home um, is a hot topic. So um, maybe we earmark that for the next text talks, um, you know, topic area from a business perspective to give you some more information on that. Um, but thank you for asking the question because it really helps us um, to help prioritise, you know, what topic areas to touch and when. Yeah, that sounds great. We'll be um, sure to get something on that for the next Tech Talk. Michelle, welcome to the stage. Um, I'm yeah. happy for you to go ahead and ask your question. I can't actually see the question, but I know the gist of what I wrote. Um, yeah. so, so it seems to me that, that in doing all this, and don't get me wrong, I think digitisation is definitely the way forward, but it, but it almost seems to me like we're doing this back to front. We're starting with residential care and its interface into the health system where, for me, we should be starting with DHSP because that's the first port of call for an elder person when they need support. Then we go to home care, then we go to resi care. And the whole point of the new health system is, or aged care system is to try and keep people at home for longer. So if we were starting with that process and collecting information, then it would help us to be able to inform what services we need to provide and how we deliver those services in the future, using that evidence to, to redesign, co-design, however you want to call it, the services and the offerings that were provided to consumers. And so it seems to me that we always go to Resi first, but there's a hell of a lot of work gets done out in community and it's a much bigger population than what we have in residential care. So why do we go there first and start that and not start it at the beginning of the chain? Let's start with what we can do to change things in community now, help providers to be able to do that. Then we can work through the chain, keeping people out of residential care for longer. 
Thanks, Michelle, for that. And I think you've actually summarised it really well. And and you're not actually the first to have communicated some, some of this. Uh, I know I've had discussions with other people in the sector. So I thank you for that. Um, why did we start with residential aged care facility? Because I, I guess that's where the reform went and that's where the priority was from last government. Um, uh, acknowledge what you're saying and we'll take that information back and you know make sure we brief um, our business and our incoming government. Um, irrespective, and, and I think there's an opportunity for us to actually solution more generically the ecosystem in exactly how you just explained it um, around what's the value chain from when you can support someone in the home through to, you know, they might have a fall, they go into, you know, a hospital, they come back to the home at home and then uh, over time maybe they move into a residential aged care facility. And for me, about digital readiness is about taking a step back and looking at that journey at a sort of high level so that when we start to pick and choose problem spaces and priorities, uh, we can actually solution them together in the context of what we know the end state to look like. What you just said, if we if we take that and, oh, you know, it's recorded, we might actually do that with your permission and kind of summarise it as if if that's the North Star, if that's the goal of the end state, it's not a perfect world. We don't get to start from the beginning and work our way through progressively. Um, as we start to identify pain points that we want to address, like low hanging fruit that we want to fix, we do that in the context of the whole of what the North Star looks like. So hopefully, you know, it, I hear you. It's not something I can actually say, yep, yeah, we're going to rearrange it all. It's not my decision or anyone here, but we'll take the feedback. Um, but I think it's important we use that information when we're working together anyway to, to solution as a whole. Does anyone else want to add anything there? Paul, Jason? Thanks, Faye. I, um, I, I, I said it before, so I'll be covering old ground, but um, everything that you just said, I, I agree Thanks. with. There's two questions here, though. One's a, an overarching policy question, which seems to go to the comments that's been being fed through. And it's the right question to ask. I, I have, have no issue with the question. It comes down to us um, for authority, especially in the Digital Health Agency and the work we're doing. We've got a, whilst it's a big program of work for us, it's a it's a reasonably small program of work in the context of all of the recommendations for the Royal Commission. There's a, there's a a lot of work happening it's um you know it's a myriad of activity it's quite um staggering the amount of work that's happening but in relation to the, the setting with which we're starting in we're kind of operating in an authorized environment we've been we've been given our, our marching orders what i'm trying to do and what i'm really keen to do which is why i've had a number of conversations with home care providers is how do we understand the broader environment and build towards so we don't um, we don't have to replicate, duplicate, or, or end up with technical debt. Uh, I, I'm keen to understand that broader piece. Uh, I can't give you the answer that you want, but I actually think you're asking a, a more of a policy question than than the the piece of work we're doing in relation to. Um, our, our part of responding to the Royal Commission, but it is an ongoing conversation and phase right. That is a discussion we have to have with government and uh, we'll be looking to push uh, uh, for answers to those questions as well. Because it has to come, it has to come. And and the, the sequencing um, is the question that you're asking. Uh, for me, it's it's how do we understand the broader environment and not build anything that gets in our road. That's what I'm trying to do. Great. Anybody have anything else they wanted to add to that one? No? Okay, we'll keep moving. Um, so Mike T has a popular question. So we thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. Um, Mike T has a popular question, so we'll queue him up. Um, but just while we're waiting on Mike, I've got a question for Jason. Um, what is the Department of Health's current aged care digital strategy? That's a great question. Um, so um, the Royal Commission made recommendation 109, um, which um, went to an ICT strategy for aged care. Um, we are working uh, on developing a digital strategy with um, with Faye and her team um, within the department. Um, we've done some early work uh, thinking about what a digital, digital strategy should do, what it should include. Um, we haven't commenced any engagement or consultation activities to date. Um, we've been held back a little bit with, with Caretaker. 
and I'm sure um, everyone on the line can appreciate we uh, we have an incoming government. Um, we have been working hard on developing incoming government briefs. Um, we very much look forward to briefing a new minister when they're announced. It could be any minute now. Um, uh, <laughs> um, and so uh, we will be working through that strategy over the next couple of months and we'll be reaching out um, through this forum and others uh, and asking for, for um, stakeholders to cooperate with us help us build and develop that strategy um, and, and build a kind of digital vision for aged care out to 2030. So we're very much looking forward to this work um, and looking forward to working with everyone on the line. Uh, and we will have much more to say with opportunities for um, collaboration and um, input into that digital strategy. So watch this space. Thanks, Janine. Thanks, Jason. Okay, Mike, welcome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my question was around, um, I had a look at some of the industry partners uh, that were involved and a lot of them relate to um, what we do with the data once it's already collected and, and going through the system. And I was wondering if there's any engagement going on with um, people who are starting to develop products and solutions that are gathering data about people. Uh, so there's the lot of smart home technologies that are out at the moment. Uh, there's wearables that are gathering health metrics. So a part of the digital transformation, I would have thought that sort of a, a foundational piece is um, is having that data all the way from you know, it, its source and flowing through the system. I just wondered, is that part of what you're looking at? Um, yes, and I might answer that just to give you a little bit more context of the information we've presented today. That list of providers that you saw halfway through the presentation today were actually the ones that are developing with ADHA and Laura and Paul can give you a little bit more info there. The ones that have vo volunteered to co-design with Department of Health, which is the, you know, the co-design group, um, will be publishing them up on the web um, uh, very soon. Um, you are correct. There's the there's kind of two you know two or three swim lanes happening in parallel um, because you know to be honest we can't afford to do this all sequentially, right? So uh, we're just trying to collate all the information and, and let you know what's going on and where. So we do d need to double down on medical you know health uh, data with my health record and all the work that our partner agency is doing there. But in the co-design sessions that we're doing um, more broadly in the Department of Health, a lot of that is just to get ready digitally for a variety of APIs. And yes, when it comes to actually reporting on the care minutes or the financial transparency or, you know, what they're eating or, you know, whatever those new initiatives are, I agree with you. I think there's uh, definitely an opportunity uh, to create APIs that are more connected to the IoT devices. Um, so happy for people to kind of put their hands up with that as the initiatives come down the pipeline. Um, a big part of that is going to be what we're prioritising and when and how do we solve for that. And if you recall earlier in the discussion, I talked about design thinking, which is looking at the problem space and actually understanding what are the different ways we can solve for that. We did the, the lean experimentation in the middle and I think that's where we could absolutely start to look at ways of using barcodes on clothes or you know plates to measure like the weight of the food to go have they eaten you know what they should have eaten like there's a myriad of opportunities on how we solve for some of this um, which is a slightly different way of collecting data but we're not there yet we have to set up the tech foundations so uh, and I think that's why we're trying to prioritize this to get up and running whilst we're solving uh, on the business outcomes and use cases we want to focus on thanks anyway. Matt. Anyone um, else want to add there? No. Hey, it's Paul. Um, Mike, it's a really good question. Uh, mm. there, there's, a, there's an awful lot of conversations happening in this space. Uh, we've met with a number of different organisations, you know, both, you know, in Australia, overseas, provide things like virtual wards and, and all the rest of it. Like there's a stack, there's a stack of work happening in this space across a range. Um, in, in the first instance, in response to the Royal Commission, as I've said a number of times today, what we put up on the screen there are those partners who have declared an interest in working with us quickly to use what exists 
to try and get the information in there as quickly as we can to support the people that need it. Um, does other work need to happen to get the ghost to the point you're talking about? Absolutely. It, it becomes a, a digital maturity conversation, evolution conversation to a point. Uh, as we work through this, how much can we do at once? How much do we bite off? Um, but but yes, please know. And I'm more than, again, a little bit like the, the CHSP, Commonwealth Home Support, I shouldn't say acronyms, should I? Um, the Commonwealth Home Support Program, anybody that's interested in talking to us about what it means for them, so we can keep that in mind as we build out. Um, uh, also be interested in those as well. I've had several, I've had several in the last few weeks, um, more than interested in have those conversations about how that might look uh, for us in our planning and development. Um, it's a very, very large chessboard and, and I don't for a minute think that I can see it all. I'm more than happy to be guided by those who, who see things that I don't. Thanks very much, Mike. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Faye. Yeah, thank you. Um, it, it really is exciting to start thinking about um, the type of technology journeys we can go on in the future and building that strong foundational capability will give us a launching pad um, for the years to come, which is so important. Um, so we have a hand up in the audience from uh, Bev Brooker. And so we're just going to bring Bev to stage. But in the meantime, a quick question. Is the co-design volunteer group closed for new volunteers? Faye, Dale, somebody want to jump in on that one? Uh, uh, that's a hard one. <laughs> Dale, Officially, yes. <laughs> Officially, yes. But um, if you want to send an email to the Digital Transformation uh, Office, that which was the, if you're one of the subset that we haven't got covered, so there's a, a set of, providers that we need to get good coverage, uh, then yes, we'd like to hear from you. So send your, your request in and we'll see what we can do. No promises, but you know. We'll, um, we'll put that uh, email address up on screen before we close today. And it will also be in the survey email that goes out to you. Yeah. Great, Bev, thanks for joining us. Hi, thanks. Um, I'd just like to know how the My Age Care um, fits into this work. Um, we are a CHSP um, provider, so certainly interested in, in this area. Um, the My Age Care is, if you remember that digital maturity piece, it is the that third set step, which is you go into your portal and you know you put some stuff in. Uh, it's definitely part of the ecosystem and will continue. Um, but we're hoping to reduce some of the administration. So anything you can do in my age care, we'd like to get to the point where if you did something in your own software, in your own facilities, using your own tools, that um, you could connect automatically and give us that information at the same time. Um, now, that's a very generic statement, what I just said, and, you know, uh, when you send that information, like pick an example like care minutes, maybe, you know, you batch it up and you send it at a certain point in time, like, but you're not having to rekey it into my age mm. care. It is about trying to automate and get digitally connected appropriately, like however we need to digitise the, the business process. Um, so, yep. Yeah, Think of this as the broader ecosystem of my age care and how we're getting digitally connected. Um, there is a specific portal there today and this will be augmented. Uh, anyone else want to add anything to that? No? Excellent. Who do we, another question there, Janine? Thanks very much, Bev. Um, so we have uh, Sally Hagar, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, coming to the screen next. Um, in the meantime, we've got a comment, so I'm just going to read that one out. System should be seamless, single point of assessment through community, through to RACFs. So that's a good one for our design folks to note. Um, the next question, what interoperability standards are you looking at using? Is FHIR being considered? for health data exchange. This might be another one for Faye or Dale. I'm happy to take this one, Faye. Oh, this is more, yes. this is more oh. ADHA. This okay. is the bread and butter. Over to you. You no. all the book, guys. So, so I'll, I'll, a, a very short answer is always a good answer. And I think when it comes to the, the work, any, any work that we're doing in relation to clinical information, the short answer is when you ask if it's being considered is absolutely yes. 
And we in uh, the Department of Health are actually uh, absolutely backing that because we want one standard when it comes to your clinical um, interoperability standards. And so we, we definitely align to that. Um, yeah, Laura, do you want to add something there? All good? Like, all good. Okay. Dale? Hi, Sally. Hello. Oh, sorry. You no, it's Dale. all good. Sally? Well, I think for, um, this part of the context too is, as, as Paul rightly said, so for clinical, you're looking at sort of, you know, you talk about the fire standard, but, you know, for payments, it's a different standard to fire. So I, I suppose the challenge for us as a collective, which is what I was referring to, is, is how do we link those together so that we can, um, you know, we, we get better use out of, I suppose, you know, provider software and on their in-house capability. Great point, Dale. Thank you. Thanks, Dale. So, Sally, welcome. Hello. Hi. Feel free Hi. to ask your question and um, direct it to who you'd like if you have someone in mind. So mine was around the standardisation of the reporting requirements that we have. We communicate with health through many different ways and lots of sets of data, and there is no consistency in the different sets. And we know technical specifications that equal each other. And it's a real struggle, I guess, in our industry to get into the format to automate, to meet the requirements of new systems and things as you change them. So I guess I wanted to find out what work's happening in that space to get standardisation in the communication method so we can automate rather than multiple technical specifications and multiple portals that we report to. Yes, I think also, Sally, I was just looking, were you also the one that referenced that you're doing it many times, many different ways for the different? I um, think it was Chong Li, Chong Yi. Chong, Chong started with that. And so, yeah. it, so thank you. It's actually a really insightful question. And it's one that we did raise um, up to go as providers. There's 60% overlap in my age care, like age care providers to disability care and veterans, you know, and and you've got different portals for different purposes. So when you want to get paid, you know, Services Australia has their portal for payments and so forth. Uh, it's definitely been raised last year. Um, and we have started developing a provider management system for data tracking and quality purposes. Um, and we are looking to, to ask and brief government on what the next steps are about how can we bring some of that together. Um, Jason, did you want to add anything there at all? No, no, I think you've captured it, Faye. Okay. But uh, it it is an insight that we're aware of, um, Sally, and that we, ha we are actively discussing internally around how do we synthesise some of that and bring it together. Uh, we're all shaking in our boots about support at home. How are we going to get paid? Yes, so that one there, they haven't had any authority yet. Uh, they're in the consultation phase. Um, so the business is definitely consulting out there. Um, hopefully you've been to some of those sessions. Um, I think there's more discussion to be had with the sector. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, what happens is you come up with a, a way that you want us to give you another set of data when we're changing programs, but we find out when it's time to start getting money other than in time to make a change to support it. Understand. And that's why we're talking now, right? So hopefully this is a way of getting early discussion um, and designing together. Um, we're in this, I've got to be honest with you, we're in this awkward stage of between governments and we really can't tell you a lot. I'm being really open with you guys on it. So we just need to wait and if, you know, if we're lucky by the end of the day, we'll know who our minister is. Um, and, you know, then we'll need a bit of time to brief them on that. I'm fingers crossed the next tech talk, we'll be able to give you a little bit more insight on the specific policy initiatives that we can then use to help prioritise some of these standards and the discussions on how we bring it all together. No worries. Thanks so much. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Sally. Thanks, Sally. Much appreciated. Just a reminder too that we do really try and work closely with business as we develop the agendas for the tech talk. So if there are particular areas of the business that um, uh, that you want to deep dive into, then we can um, get those uh, best assistant secretaries along and, and have them speak to it. So uh, the next person we're inviting to the stage is Natasha. Um, 
in the meantime, I'll very quickly uh, just uh, sling a question at Jason. So is a projected outcome that nurses will not be tied up with documentation as they currently are? Um, I think if we're here for any reason whatsoever, um, any single reason, it's to ensure that the maximum amount of time is dedicated to providing meaningful care to senior Australians. And if I, I guess that's the main aim of um, digitally enabling the sector is to make sure that that the workforce isn't tied up with with administration unnecessarily. I think there's a related question too around workforce digital literacy, and we've been thinking a lot about that. Um, so it's all well and good to have the tech, but if the workforce isn't able to use it or hasn't been trained to use it, then um, that's also causes difficulty. Um, and um, so as part of the digital strategy, that's been something that we've been thinking about too. We, the, the workforce, aged care workforce has been really at the forefront of our mind. Um, and we'll be making sure that we um, consider um, the workforce and literacy levels, understanding where they're at, um, what we may, might be able to do to support and uplift in, in literacy in the workforce. So I think that's a really great question. Great, Jason. That's really good to hear. That was definitely um, one of the themes that came out of the survey responses to the first tech talk was the importance of that digital literacy um, for the workforce primarily, but also for consumers. So that's great to hear. We have Natasha joining us on stage. Natasha, take it away. I'm not sure. We don't have video for you, so we might just have audio. Natasha, you might be on mute still. No. But we're just waiting on Natasha. Um, so in the meantime, I'll throw to an anonymous question. Um, so this one is for Paul. Uh, where are we at regards to having a legal electronic medication chart that acts like a prescription for the pharmacy, especially important for controlled drugs? Yeah, I can probably talk to that, Paul. Um, Thank you, Laura. That, that's thanks, Laura. I'm saying that's actually for Laura. <laughs> um, it, it, it is, but it, it, it's actually one, one for the department, but the departmental colleagues who work on this actually are um, in this talk at the moment. So um, I, I will have a crack at letting you know where that's at. So there's still um, obviously a, a rollout under a trial arrangement of the, it's called the Electronic National Residential Medication Chart. That's ENRMC, if you wanted to add another acronym to your pile of government acronyms. Um, that trial, as I understand it, is being extended um, because we haven't got uh, prescription delivery services that are currently conformant with the right sort of set of conformance arrangements. Um, so they're extending that trial arrangement um, that will enable um, you know, dispense and prescribe uh, to occur off an electronic medication chart. Um, you know, probably for, I won't, don't quote me on the exact time frame, but certainly for a number of months longer than they anticipated. And so there'll be software that will be listed as being conformant for that sort of transitional piece while we wait for the EP, the electronic prescribing ecosystem to, to catch up in broad terms. Um, and so that will be um, available. I think we can take, also take the remainder of that question sort of back on notice and just make sure that our departmental colleagues um, in the medicine sector you know, have the opportunity to answer that one as well. But um, those products will be available uh, and be able to you be used in that trial arrangement uh, ongoing. Thanks very much, Laura. While I have you there, there's another question for you. Um, if a provider needs education help to access My Healthcare Records, is there support available through the agency? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have uh, a team of people that can assist with that. Um, I'm happy to send a link out if I can get get time to get a link, I'll put it in the chat. Um, but we do have people um, in the agency that can help uh, vendors and others become conformant with my health record. Great, thanks so much. Um, Nicole, welcome to the stage. Happy to have you. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. Oh. Speak up. We're just having some trouble hearing you. You might need to lean in. <laughs> better. That's better. <laughs> um, so we're a not small not for profit in North. Um, in North for our I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think you're gonna have to hold it a little closer. <laughs> Here we go. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Sorry. Perfect. Um, okay, take two. Take three. Um, <laughs> we're a small not-for-profit in northeast Victoria, which is great. We do CHISP and also home care packages to our communities and surround, which is great. Unfortunately, we're geographically diverse, which is problematic. Um, question I have for, I suppose, really going to support at home, which is fine, that's where we're going. We do have lots of our staff that are really concerned about their jobs and also how this means with the funding and how it's all coming through and how this looks. I know there's change in government. I know this potentially will probably change. I know your hands are probably tied, but do you have any information that we can probably help um, relieve some stress from our workers so we don't have a mass exodus, which is already happening in our industries up here and I suppose across the board? I'm going to take that one, Nicole, and I'm not really? going to give you that. <laughs> no, it is, and it's very real, and that's part of change, right? So, yeah. Um, and look, uh, I think we should probably take your details and uh, and connect with you more specifically, so with our counterparts in the business around support yeah. at home, um, to understand how is the business model, how do you, how are you guys perceiving the business model change and the impacts on you? Yeah, I suppose, and look, and that's probably the information we're getting out to. Potentially, it's not clear, and yeah. that's probably eating into lots of. I love change. I'm probably a crazy. Change is good. It makes people uncomfortable. It makes things better. It's a fact of life. Unfortunately, um, I suppose that's probably is the uncertainty. Is we can't. I suppose as an exec here at our business, we can't give assurance to our workers that we can guarantee you'll have a job. 1st of July 2023 with the funding changes we can't guarantee that and that's huge like we have 500 volunteers we have 120 odd staff it is and we're small by all means we have a population here in the city of 5,000 so like it's very real I suppose for us and the impact that this will have we are probably one of the chess providers within 100 k's of here. So it's just becoming a little bit real, especially the way the world is going. Just want to be able to, like we're in this to care. We care, we love our people, we want to help. Yeah. We just want to make sure that we can do that going forward and how we can do that. No, and I appreciate that. And so acknowledge the question and the feedback. Um, it's yeah. not something I can answer myself here or I don't think any of our panellists here today. Um, but let's, if we can get your details, um, and we'll contact you outside of this and put you in contact. Um, for us, even to understand your perspective, you know, in more detail, and I'm sure there's people who understand it already, uh, but you're talking to someone who, who doesn't no, have the, that's fine. yeah, and at least that way we can maybe take the action to to provide some information out there because if you've got yep. concerns, there's others with concerns. It means we need to communicate a bit more. So, yep. um, how about we take take that as the the answer for here right now? No, work together. That. Thanks. Thank really you. appreciate that. the question, Nicole. Right. And well, this is this is the thing, right? We're transformation, so. We want to have the conversation so we can keep the communication channels open. Thank you. I unfortunately have to draw a bit of a close um, to the Q&A. So you're off the hook, guys. Thank you for the Brady Bunch panel. Um, it's been another really good session. We definitely do, again, have more questions than we've been able to answer today. So um, as soon as we get our minister and 
uh, we're good to to start answering some of those questions, particularly around our future direction. We'll get those up on um, the health website uh, on our digital okay. transformation stage. Yep. If I can just, um, you know, thank our, um, everyone. Um, so Eliza, who spoke for us for the business, uh, Paul, thank you so much um, for attending with Laura. We really appreciate the, the partnership um, and the, the coming together. Um, I really want to thank everyone in the sector for joining. Um, hopefully you're finding these sessions informative. Um, we've had lots of insight in the chat session and yeah, appreciate the hiccup with Slido. So um, I appreciate that you guys are, you know, going with the flow with us. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to thank you all. And we lo I look forward to doing more of these and using the information and the feedback to help drive the discussion. Thanks so much, Faye. Um, we'll be sending out an email after the event. It'll have a link to a survey in it. So again, we're really keen to hear your feedback and uh, anything that we haven't gotten to today that you'd like us to touch on next time, definitely put it into that survey. Um, as Bay mentioned, we'll be holding our next Tech Talk somewhere around six weeks from now. Um, by then we will have welcomed our new minister and we'll be able to talk um, more specifically about our future program. Um, in the meantime, any questions can be emailed to the Digital Transformation Office. The email's on screen now. Um, and we are hoping to hit on more subjects around connecting data across the sector at our next Tech Talk. Final words from Faye. Nothing else from me. I've said my thank yous okay. uh, and I uh, hope you uh, um, just wanted to say happy Reconciliation Week to all and uh, yeah, talk soon. Great. Thanks all. Thanks everyone. Appreciate you attending.